in the physics unit, guys, one of the, the, the main theme of this physics unit, because it comes up all the time, is work and energy. Okay, work energy theorem, work and energy. Okay, now, when I say the word work, you're probably all thinking, oh, so sit down and write stuff and do my assignments and whatever. That's not the kind of work I mean. I mean work from a physics perspective. Work from a physics perspective means changing the energy of something else. When you do work on something, you change its energy. You're either taking its energy away, well, technically that's it doing work on you, okay, or you're giving it energy, that is, you're transferring and doing work on it. So, as an example, I take this hole punch, right, and it's on the floor, okay? Does that hole punch have any energy? Not really. It can't do anything there, can it? Right? It's on the floor. It can't fall. It's as low as it can go. And it's not moving. So it really, it can't do any work. Okay? It can't change the energy of anything else. It's basically got no energy. So now I bend down and I pick it up. And I put it right here. Okay? Does it have energy now? Yes, it does. Okay? It's not moving still. It's sitting there on the table. But it could fall. And because it could fall, it has potential energy. Okay? There's two types of energy, potential and kinetic. Right? Kinetic energy has to do with moving objects or charges or basically movement of any kind. Uh, and potential energy is either due to position or state. Okay? And by state, I mean some things are flammable, some things are explosive, okay? things like that. So um, looking at this, okay, this now has what we call gravitational potential energy. Because were it to be knocked off, just put that on my desk, Julia. Okay, um, were this to be knocked off the table, it could do work. If my foot was under it when that happened, it could do work on my foot. Right? It could change the shape of my foot in an undesirable way. All right? That counts. All right? Um, it could do work on the floor. It could change the shape of the floor, leave a little mark or scratch or dent. And it would certainly make a lot of noise when it fell. And sound is a form of energy. Right? So all of these things tell us, even though that thing's not moving, it has energy because it has the potential to do something else. Everyone follow there? Now, the way it got that potential energy was from me. I did work. Okay? When you do work, you exert a force through a distance. All right? So when I picked this up, I had to pull on it. Agreed? I had to work against gravity and I had to pull it about, what, a little over a meter? Okay? And set it there. That's work. I exerted a force through a distance. That's why lifting things is work. All right? The heavier the thing is you, that you lift, the more work you have to do. All right? Everyone okay with that? All right. So what we look at a lot in this unit is how do we convert one form of energy to another? How do we give something energy? So it's always back to this work and energy. How do they go together? Okay, and things like that. So you don't have this page, but we're going to just quickly talk about it here. This picture is showing the Inuit blanket toss. Okay, uh, and you're probably going, that seems like a silly thing to have in physics. But it's actually a really good example of work and energy and converting one form of energy to another. Okay, um, the reason the Inuit do this, okay, or they used to do it anyway, is because if you go up to the tundra where they live, it's very flat. Okay, it's like southern Saskatchewan, right? You can see from one side of the province to the other. That's, you can't really, but, okay. Essentially, because the Earth is curved, there's a fixed distance that you can see in a flat environment. And that fixed distance is about 30 kilometers to the horizon. We see farther here because we're, we're at elevation, so we get the advantage of the angle, okay. But in a flat area, like if you were on the ocean, you could see 30 kilometers basically before the curve of the Earth didn't allow you to see anything anymore, all right. So, if you're hunting a herd of caribou, in the tundra, which is what the Inuit would do, okay, you can only see so far. You don't want to walk 30 kilometers in the wrong direction. So what you do is you put the lightest person in your group on the blanket, and everyone grabs a hold of it, and they throw them into the air, really high, as far as they can. They catch them, don't worry, okay? But it puts them at an elevated position so that they can see further. Because there's no trees, okay? There's no trees in the tunnel. You can't just climb a tree and look, okay? There's no mountains or hills or anything like that. So you've got no advantage of, of, uh, of distance, of being able to see distance. So this is how they would do it, all right? Um, now, in order to get that person to that height, 
there has to be work. Because if that person is just standing on the ground, they don't have any energy. They're on the ground and they're not moving. Right? So to get them that high up in the air, these people are standing around, okay, on the edges of the blanket, okay, they've got to do work. All right? So they put the person on the blanket and they all grab a hold and they pull. Okay? Is pulling exerting a force? It is. Okay? And they do that over a distance, however long their arms are. Okay? And in that distance, okay, they do work. And they change the energy of the person who's on the blanket. All right? That person will very quickly gain speed. Okay? Because they're having work done on them. Their kinetic energy is changing. Now, that will continue until they leave the blanket. Once they're not touching the blanket anymore, the people can't exert force on them anymore. Agreed? Right? So at that point, all the work has been done. Okay? They're gonna, they've got as much energy now as they're going to have. So once they leave the blanket, they continue to move upwards, but they, can, they continually do what as they move upwards? Lose, well, not so much lose energy, because they don't really lose energy, but they lose speed. All right, uh, so they slow down, and that happens when you jump. Okay, if you jump straight up in the air, okay, you slow down, slow down, slow down. You kind of instantaneously come to a stop at your maximum height, and then begin to fall back to earth. All right, what's going on during that time is their kinetic energy, which has to do with their speed, is going down, but their potential energy, which has to do with their height, is going up. So one's going down, one's going up, but their total amount of energy is staying the same. Because they got energy from the people who threw them in the air. They can't lose that or gain that. Okay? It's ar they've already got it. So as they reach their maximum height, they've got no kinetic energy because they're not moving, but they've got lots of potential because they're way up here. Then they begin to fall. And as they begin to fall, they begin to speed up. So that potential gets converted back into kinetic. Now, that doesn't seem like such a big deal, except that they're falling. Okay? They have energy. What needs to happen to them? They need to be slowed down. Gently. Okay? They could slow down by crashing into the ground, but I think that would change their shape in an undesirable manner. All right? They'd probably break their arm or leg. So we don't want that. Right? So we, the people that are now waiting, that are holding on to the blanket, need to do more work. They need to absorb that person's energy now. Okay? So they're going to do the same thing they did before. They're going to exert a pulling force on the blanket through the same distance, slowing them down gently to the ground. Okay? Everyone with me there? So we see that energy is being converted. Okay? We see obviously the potential in the kinetic, but what we don't see is where did the people who did the work get their energy from? Well, they got it from the food they ate. Okay? So we're seeing a different kind of energy being turned into something else and being used to do something. And once we realize that energy could be converted from one form to another, that's when technology really took off. Machines that could do, do effective work for us. Okay, when we realize that energy can be converted. All right. Okay. So we're going to talk about forms of energy today. The two types of energy are kinetic and potential. Okay? Subforms of those are things like chemical, uh, electrical, and things like that. Okay? So we're going to say, here's a form of energy. It is a, it is a form of potential energy, or this is a form of kinetic energy. Okay? Because there's the two types that all the forms fall into. Okay? Everyone with me there? All right. So the problem with energy was this. It was hard to explain. It was hard to demonstrate. It was hard to show it to people because you can't capture it. Right? Energy isn't matter. They're different. Right? So, you know, when people said, "Well, this, you know, when I when I set this thing on fire, it gives, you know, there's energy there." Well, how do you know? Well, I don't know. It just is. Well, catch it. Well, you can't. You can't catch energy. Right? It, it can travel through matter. Okay? It can travel through a vacuum even. Right? It isn't something you can put in a bottle. So that was the, the reason that it was really hard for people to explain, measure, and quantify what energy exactly was. So it took quite a while for that idea to take hold. And once it did, then people were finding different forms of it, using it, harnessing it, okay, converting it, and things like that. Okay? Uh, so 
Experimental evidence eventually supported the theory that heat was another form of energy. Heat was the form of energy that we use most often. It's the worst form of energy, okay? But it's it's the one we use most often because it's also the easiest to make. Right? Basically, any time you convert one form of energy to another, heat's a byproduct. So you're always making heat, but heat's always the lowest form. All right? Okay. Most common form of energy that we use is chemical energy. Okay? We've been using chemical energy since we discovered fire. All right? Well, even before that, because metabolically our, our bodies run on chemical energy too. But okay, we've been using energy just to do work okay, since we discovered fire. Fire is a chemical reaction, and it releases heat. Okay? And that's what most chemical energy does. You can convert chemical energy into electricity, and you can convert it into other things. Okay? But for the most part, chemical energy okay, is, is used to, to make heat. Now, what gives something chemical energy? Is it movement or is it their nature? It's their nature. It's their chemical nature. It's a chemical property. Okay, having chemical energy is a chemical property. All right. So um, chemical energy then is a form of potential energy. All right. So down here it says chemical energy is the potential energy stored in the chemical bonds of compounds. When we realized that that's where chemical energy came from, that's when the science of fuel development really took off. Right? If you go back in time, let's say 250 years or so, the primary fuel used in factories and homes and things like that would have been what? Uh, what made the fire? What were we burning? Lots of it. Coal. Still use lots of it. Okay, Coal. Coal would have been our primary fuel. Before that, let's go back like another 200 years. Before that, it would have been wood. Yeah, all right? People burned wood because it was readily available, right? But when we discovered coal, we went almost in, I mean, yeah, you got a fire started with wood, but then you threw a lump of coal in there, okay? Why would you throw the lump of coal in there? What was so much better about coal? Yep. Okay, if I had equal masses of wood and coal, I'm getting exponentially more energy out of the coal. Right? It's, it's a better fuel. And that's because of the way it's made. Coal is essentially compressed and partly decomposed and you know, stuff of, of old trees, okay? of ancient forests and things like that. That's how coal is made. When that ancient forest died and fell down or whatever, it got compressed and buried and exposed to heat and pressure, and that stuff turned into peat, and then it turned into coal. And if you kept heating and pressurizing it, it would turn into diamonds okay eventually all right but let's say we're stopping at coal because you don't set diamonds on fire um, they don't burn anyway uh, so when you uh, when you pressurize this and you get this coal essentially if I had like a lump of coal that was five kilograms that might represent many trees okay remember it got buried and compressed and chemically altered so it's a much more concentrated fuel there's way more energy in it than is in a five kilogram piece of wood Right? There's less energy there because we're talking about one piece of a tree, whereas that lump of coal could be the pieces of many trees. Right? There's way more energy in there. So, um, give you an example here. Okay, this is propane. Three carbons, eight hydrogens. Okay. Chemical energy is the potential energy stored in the bonds between atoms of a molecule. What do we use propane for? Barbecuing, yeah, cooking. I mean, if you have an RV, it's used to run your furnace and all of your cooking stuff and whatever. Okay, your hot water tank uses propane in an RV, all right, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, you've got this thing here. It's got some bonds, and if we burn it, those bonds will break and their energy will be released. Okay, can you run a car on propane? You can. Some people convert their vehicles to propane. They, they, it used to be more common, but it's not as common now because those cars generally tended to lose a fair amount of power. All right. Uh, propane was not as good a fuel as gasoline, 
right? For a couple of reasons. First off, it's a pressurized gas, okay? And it's dangerous. You can't park in an underground parking structure if you have a propane-operated vehicle, okay? But also because it's small. It's a small molecule. Gasoline, on the other hand, has eight carbons and 18 hydrogens. Okay, that's octane, the active ingredient in gasoline. Does it have more potential energy than propane does? It does. It's a better fuel. It's more concentrated. Okay, it doesn't have to be pressurized and all that kind of stuff. Okay, it's a bit safer and more practical to use okay, than propane is as a fuel for a vehicle. But if I burn equal amounts, equal masses of propane and gasoline, I'm going to get more energy out of the gasoline. And that's what this guy did. Antoine Lavoisier realized that when you take equal amounts of substances and burn them, the chemical reactions produced different amounts of heat. Okay? Fuels are different. Right? Some things burn really hot. Some things don't. Some things you need to burn a lot of. Some things you don't. Right? That's kind of what he discovered. Uh, another example would be if you took paraffin, which is candle wax. Okay? Candle wax is C22H46 or something like that. Okay, it's a gigantic carbon chain. Right? If you burn candle wax and then you burn a similar amount of gasoline, you'll get more energy out of the candle wax. Okay? Because it's got more bonds and thus more potential energy. We just don't run cars on candle wax because there's certain practical problems with moving a solid through fuel lines. Okay, things like that. All right? But if you've ever used an emergency candle, Right? You know that those emergency candles can heat a fairly large area. Right? So you should always, by the way, have one of those in your glove box. If your car ever stalls when it's 40 below, okay, light that candle. Because it'll keep your car warm enough to keep you alive. Okay? They are seriously, they put out a lot of heat okay, for something so small. Because candle wax is a good concentrated fuel. Alright, so is that making sense? So what we need to remember, okay, is chemical energy is potential energy, and it's potential energy stored in the chemical bonds of compounds. We release that in a chemical reaction. All right, electricity. Electricity is different. Okay. Electricity is not potential energy. Okay. Electricity is kinetic because it is the energy or the work done by moving charges. When something is being run by electricity, okay, and you plug it into the wall, it looks like there's a wire running to the to the unit, but it's actually not one wire, it's two. One's bringing the energy in, and the other is taking energy out, because you don't use all of the electrical energy when the, when a current passes through an electrical device. So let's say you're making a smoothie in the morning. You got your blender hooked up to the wall. Okay? You've got high energy moving charges moving through the through the electrical cord. Okay? They encounter the electric motor. And when they get to the electric motor, they can spin it. But as they spin the electric motor, they do work on it, which means they transfer some of their energy to the motor. After they pass through the motor, they don't have quite as much energy. Right? So they, uh, they go back into the wall and through the power grid and whatever, but they have less energy than they had before okay? because they were used to do useful work. Right? Does that sort of make sense to everybody? Okay? It's the same thing with a battery. If you hook up a battery to something, okay, the electrons, the moving charges come out the negative end. Okay? They go through your device and they go back in the positive end. Right? But they have less energy when they get back to the positive end because they've been used to do something and they've lost some energy, which is why gradually you get less and less productivity out of a battery. Okay? Eventually there's just not enough difference between the negative end and the positive end for that current to flow and do any useful work. Okay, everyone good with that? Right. I think the example I used with my class this morning was like an old Walkman. You guys ever seen like the the walk? You've probably seen one in a museum that really dates me, but okay, they they these tape playing things that Sony made, right? And and they would take like four AA batteries, and they'd last for about two hours, right? But the the electrons are still doing work. They're moving through that electric motor that turns the tape, okay? But even more importantly than that, they're moving through the wires that go to the headphones. And this is still true for when you listen to music on your phone now, okay? The, the electrons move into the, into the headphones, and in your headphones and in all speakers are little magnets okay, that are attached to a cone that can oscillate back and forth. So it activates the magnet, and that pulls the cone towards it, and then 
it deactivates the magnet and the cone moves away. Okay, or it switches the polarity and pushes the cone away, okay, in some cases. And in either case, the cone moves back and forth and disturbs the air and creates sound waves. Right? But every time those electrons have to go through that magnet, they're used to pull the cone towards them, they lose some energy. And eventually your battery wears down and you've got to plug your phone in. Okay? Everyone follow on that? Right? And you can sort of see that if, you're, if you kind of doubt what I'm saying. Find someone who's got, got one, of, one of those cars that when it drives by goes tss, 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 and then, then watch their subs because their subs will go like this and you'll be able to see the, the speakers move up and down. Okay? And, and that's the magnets activating and pulling that big cone down and then deactivating and pushing it back up. Okay? And then that again disturbs the air. Some of them so much so that you can get a massage sitting in the chair in the car. Okay? Right? The vibration against your back feels nice. All right? Everyone with me there? All right, so that's electrical energy. Okay, and again, we're using okay, we're using the kinetic energy. Whoa, of moving charges. Why did I do that? Okay, um, does that make sense to everybody? The moving charges thing. All right. Um, now. Volta was another guy. He's pretty important. Volta came up with this idea. He came up with the idea of the battery. Right? If you've ever looked real closely at a battery, it often says pile alkaline battery on it because it's this. It's a Volta pile. Right? Most of them aren't actually piles anymore, but they have um, chemicals in them. Okay? And those chemicals have the potential difference between positive and negative, and that's what creates your current flow. Okay? So it is actually converting chemical energy into electrical energy. And that was a big discovery okay, for Volta and for everyone because it proved that you could turn one form of energy into another. Okay? And that was a big deal because most of our technology involves converting one form of energy to another in order to do useful work. Okay? Uh, so it, his work provided evidence of the connection between chemical energy and electrical energy all right, for him, and that essentially became the first battery. Okay? So the Volta pile could produce constant electric current, not forever. Okay? The Volta pile did not last very long, but that is the ancient ancestor of the modern AA battery. All right, next up, still to do with electricity and magnetism, okay, came a guy named Orsted and a guy named Faraday. These two guys' contributions to our modern society are s overlooked so often, okay, but without these two things, modern society would not exist, quite frankly. Okay, Orsted's, he, he had this experiment first, and it was completely by accident. He was teaching a class at a university, and he had a, a compass that he was going to use for one part of the lesson, and he had this apparatus that basically just was a circuit, so it had a current carrying wire attached to a power supply okay, um, that he was using for another part. And it just so happened that he set the compass underneath the wire. Right? Now, you're probably thinking, so what? Big deal. The compass pointed north. Yes, it did. Until he flipped the switch. And once the electric current started flowing through the wire, the compass went parallel to the wire. Okay? Now you're probably thinking, so? Okay? That was a big deal. He's looking at the compass, and it's pointing north like a compass should, and suddenly it's pointing east. So, you know, Orsted, being a physics guy, went, oh, crap, the north pole moved. We're in really big trouble because my compass is no longer pointing north, and that is a really big deal. Okay? So he turns off the circuit. Okay? Compass goes back to north. Right? Well, a compass responds to the Earth's magnetic field, which is big. Okay? It's huge. It it's goes way even beyond our planet. Its effects are beyond our planet even. Okay? But when you have an electric current, it produces a magnetic field as well. It's very weak compared to the Earth's magnetic field, but because it's so close, it can override the effects of the Earth's magnetic field yeah, temporarily okay? and make a compass point in a different direction, always parallel to the direction the charges are going. This is what we now use to build electromagnets, but also for um, tran radio transmitters, radio receivers, and all of that all rely on the fact that you can use modulated electrical current to produce magnetic effects. In other words, to produce electromagnetic waves, radio. Right? So 
Your cell phone wouldn't work if we hadn't discovered this. There'd be no Wi-Fi, okay? None of that stuff. Anything that involves the transmission of electromagnetic energy has its owes its existence to this experiment that electrical energy can have magnetic effects. All right. Um, you can sometimes see this if you have a very powerful electric current okay, running past something. You might see effects on your Wi-Fi. All right. um, a microwave, for example. Okay? A microwave uses a lot of electricity and generates a very large magnetic field around it. Okay, and as a result, if you have like you know your your phone or your, like an iPad near it, your Wi-Fi goes out on that device. Okay, because the magnetic field around it disrupts all the other transmissions in the area. It's almost like jamming. Okay, it's almost like jamming the the transmission. Okay, because it creates such a big disturbance. All right now, Faraday, he said, so if electricity produces magnetic effects, I wonder if the opposite is true. If I can use a magnet to produce electrical effects, because I'd like to be able to generate electricity easily. Right? So that's what he tried. He built a coil of wire, very simple. Okay? Just a coil of wire and took a bar magnet and pushed the bar magnet into the coil of wire. As the bar magnet moved into the coil, there was an electric current. As soon as the bar magnet stopped moving, the current stopped. So then he pulled the magnet out. As he pulled the magnet out, the current went the other way. Okay? So his voltmeter kept going back and forth, showing that current was flowing one way or current was flowing the other way. Because what was happening was the magnet was pushing the electrons in the wire. Okay? The wire is made of copper. Copper has electrons. When you push that magnet through there, it forced the electrons to move. That's an electric current. Okay? And this is the whole principle behind generating electricity. All right? We generate electricity in, in its various forms using a turbine. Right? In Alberta, we use mostly what to turn our turbines? Well, we'd like to think it's wind. We, we kid ourselves because we got all oh, these beautiful wind farms down in southern Alberta. They represent about 3% of Alberta's power grid. Okay? We usually use coal. Okay? Over 90% of all electricity in Alberta is generated by burning coal. You burn coal. You heat water into steam, and the steam goes through a turbine and turns a turbine. Okay? And what the turbine does is moves a magnet, essentially, through a coil of wire, back and forth, back and forth, okay? generating electricity. Right? Essentially, all forms of electricity are generated by a turning turbine. Wind, okay? the big propellers turn the turbine. Okay? A hydroelectric dam, falling water, turns a turbine. A nuclear power plant, nuclear reaction, heats water, water turns a turbine, okay? things like that. So essentially, this was the way, or the... the the ancestor of all electrical generation okay, for our society. So that was, it was a huge deal to discover that there was a relationship between mechanical energy, magnetism, and electricity, because it gave us a way to generate reliable, constant electric current. Okay, so we got to remember that Orsted discovered an electric current in a wire produces magnetic effects because that was the ancestor of electromagnets and tra you know electromagnetic transmission ability. Okay, um, and then uh, Faraday. Okay, showed that the reverse can happen, and he moved a magnet through the wire, and that caused electric current to flow. Okay, and that was obviously the an the uh, ancestor of electrical generators. All right, questions on any of that? Okay. Now, around that same time, because there's lots of stuff going on now, because people are discovering that there's, uh, you know, you can convert one form of energy to another, and people like this idea of electricity, because, you know, it turns lights on and things like that. Um, they said, well, this is all well and good, but I don't have a big magnet and something to keep moving the magnet back and forth all the time in my house. What I do have is a fireplace. How can I turn my fire into electricity? The answer is you can, but it doesn't work very well. Okay? In fact, it works extraordinarily poorly. Right? It is certainly not a way to generate electricity. Right? But it can be used to protect circuits. Okay? What do you have in your house that sometimes blows at inconvenient times to do with electricity? Circuit breakers, if you have a really old house, you might actually have fuses, okay? Uh, cars use fuses if you ever have an electrical problem in your car, okay? Um, what they do is there's 
a circuit breaker is essentially like a, a thermal couple. Okay, when the, the electric current gets too big, okay, it gets hot, and as a result, there is enough electrical energy produced to trip the breaker. Okay, so it actually opens the circuit and prevents any more electricity from going through, and that saves the house from burning down because the wires get hot. Okay, everyone kind of follow me there. Fuses work on the same thing. There's in a fuse, there's a very thin layer of wire that will actually burn when it reaches a certain temperature. So if too much current goes through, it just burns the wire and that stops that fuse. That fuse blows and then you don't have a fire starting anywhere else. Okay? And that guy the guy who kind of discovered that was a guy named Seebeck. Okay? He heated this apparatus here and proved that you could turn heat into electricity using Orsted's idea. He had a compass in the middle of this. He heated up this iron that was connected to copper and iron and copper they conduct electricity differently. So the moving molecules in the heated iron caused bumping kind of in this in the copper wire that caused electrons to move. And when the electrons moved, they generated an electric field or magnetic field, sorry, that caused this compass needle to reorient parallel to the to the block. Okay, so he proved yes, you could turn heat into electricity, but not very well. You needed a lot of heat, like an unsafe amount basically, and you generated very very little electricity. So we don't use it to generate electricity, but we use it to protect electrical devices okay, in the form of circuit breakers, resistors, and fuses. All right, so that was Seebeck. Okay, he invented the first thermal couple or thermal electric converter. Okay, so that little part down there would be important. Okay, we'll leave it at that for today. There's no quiz tomorrow because we just haven't gone through enough stuff. Okay, but we're going to continue on with this and thermodynamics uh, tomorrow and then uh, kind of see where we are for uh, Friday after that.